runs great. To keep a motorcycle running this well, you have to keep the carbs fine-tuned. And to do that, you have to understand the basics of carburation. Here at the training center, we get a lot of questions on carburation. A review of carburetor operating principles will help you correctly identify complaints related to carburation. And the faster you recognize a carb-related complaint, the faster you can fix it and get that customer back on the road. After viewing this program, you will be able to explain how a carburetor functions, identify how altitude and air temperature affect carburation, and describe how fuel quality affects the combustion process. A gasoline engine runs on a mixture of air and fuel. The proportion of air and fuel is called the air-fuel ratio, with the air always listed first. A 14.7 to 1 ratio of air to fuel gives the best combination of power and fuel economy. Now this ratio applies to the weights of air and fuel, not their volumes. The engine takes in about 14.7 ounces of air, that's 12 cubic feet of air for every ounce of fuel that it uses. The air-fuel ratio is critical. Mix too much fuel with the air and you get a rich air-fuel mixture. Too much fuel for the available oxygen. Power and economy will be low and unburned fuel can dilute the engine oil, damaging critical parts. On the other end of the scale, too little fuel will cause a lean air-fuel mixture, insufficient fuel for the available oxygen. The mixture will burn too hot and too quickly, causing overheating and misfiring. The carburetor turns liquid fuel into a mist, which is then vaporized by engine heat to promote ideal combustion. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Atmosphere pressure is the force of still air around us, which, at sea level, pushes against everything with about 15 pounds per square inch. This tube represents the throat of a carburetor. When the engine is stopped, there is no air moving through the tube so the air pressure inside the tube is the same as the atmospheric pressure on the outside. But when the engine is running, the air moving through the tube exerts less pressure on the inside than the still air on the outside. This decrease in pressure is represented by the area in the tube turning a lighter color. If you insert a pipe into this low pressure area and put a container of liquid under the pipe, atmospheric pressure will push the liquid up the pipe and into the moving low pressure air inside the tube. The air drawn in by the running engine flows through the carburetor causing the air pressure inside the throat to drop. Then atmospheric pressure pushes fuel from the float bowl into the throat where it's mixed with the air flowing to the cylinders. The level of the fuel in the float bowl is critical because it determines how much fuel will enter the carburetor throat. That's because the engine's air intake system is designed to produce the correct air-fuel mixture based on a given fuel level. If the fuel level adjustment in the float bowl is too high, fuel will be pushed into the throat too easily, causing a rich air-fuel mixture. A low fuel level has the opposite effect, causing a lean air-fuel mixture. To keep the fuel level stable, the float bowl is equipped with a float that operates a valve. When the float bowl level gets low, the float moves down opening the valve to let in more fuel. As fuel enters the bowl, it raises the float until it reaches a preset level when the valve closes again. The service manual shows the procedure and specification of the float bowl level for each particular carburetor. The reduced pressure in the carburetor throat not only causes fuel to enter the throat, it also atomizes the fuel. The force of the pressure pushing the fuel into the throat breaks it down into a fine mist which can blend evenly with the incoming air. Atomization is maximized when the pressure in the throat is much lower than atmospheric pressure. We add a restriction called a venturi to lower the pressure in the throat even more. Instead of a straight tube, the venturi narrows the carburetor throat slightly, causing the air to move faster as it passes through the restriction. This causes the pressure over the fuel discharge pipe to drop a bit lower. Since throat pressure depends on air velocity, a carburetor with a fixed sized venturi will only have the best throat pressure at one engine speed, but an engine must be able to run at various speeds, from idle, to cruise, to full acceleration. 
The velocity in the carburetor throat can be kept constant by fitting the carburetor throat with a variable venturi. In a variable venturi carburetor, the venturi area is small at low engine speeds to keep air velocity up, and the venturi area enlarges at higher speeds to keep velocity constant. Hondas use one of two types of variable venturi carburetors, the manually operated throttle valve carburetor and the constant velocity carburetor, CV for short. The manually operated carburetor used most often on two-stroke engines has a movable throttle valve in the venturi that's connected directly to the throttle grip. When the rider twists the throttle to accelerate, the valve moves up in the throat to let more air into the engine. Throttle valve carburetors are simple, rugged, and reliable, but they have certain limitations. At low RPM, air velocity in the throat is already low. If the rider opens the throttle quickly, the venturi area increases suddenly, causing air velocity in the throat to drop even lower. This drop in velocity reduces the fuel flow into the throat, causing a momentary lean mixture. The engine may hesitate until carburetor air velocity rises again. Carburetors have several systems, or circuits, which control the addition of fuel to the air, depending on operating conditions. Now the first of these is the cold start enrichment circuit. When an engine is starting cold, there's no engine heat to help convert the atomized fuel into a vapor. Remember that the engine can only burn vaporized fuel. In fact, when the air-fuel mixture enters the cold engine, some of the fuel condenses onto the walls of the intake port. Well, the same way water vapor from the air condenses on a cold glass. If much of the atomized fuel condenses out of the air-fuel mixture, the remaining mixture may be too lean for the engine to start or run well. To compensate, carburetors are equipped with some type of enrichment circuit, which adds extra fuel to the incoming air until the engine warms up. Now, called a cold start enrichment circuit, it guarantees that there will be enough fuel in the air-fuel mixture for the engine to run, even if some of the fuel condenses out of the mixture. Virtually all cold start systems are called a choke even though very few of them use a choke plate to block the carburetor throat. Now, most Honda cycles use one of two types of cold start enrichment circuits, the automatic system or the plunger system. Both systems have special cold start air and fuel passages which add fuel to enrich the mixture. The automatic systems use a thermowax valve or bimetallic strip to open the enrichment circuit when the engine is cold. The thermowax valve is closed by an electric heater, while a bimetallic strip closes the circuit as the engine warms up. The plunger enrichner systems are controlled by a manual choke lever or cable. Once the engine is warm, its fuel needs vary according to the work the engine is doing. The carburetor has several separate circuits, each one being the primary fuel supplier at a particular throttle opening. Their operating ranges overlap for a smooth transition from idle to full acceleration. At idle, when the throttle valve is closed, the only air getting into the engine is flowing between the bottom of the throttle valve and the floor of the carburetor throat. To make the most of the low pressure in the throat, the idle low speed fuel discharge is located on the engine side of the throttle valve. There is a cutaway at the front of the throttle valve to funnel air under the valve when it's nearly closed. The cutaway is most effective between one-eighth and one-quarter throttle opening, although its effect continues until about one-half throttle. Once the throttle valve is opened past one-quarter, the low-speed system becomes less functional and the main metering system gradually takes over. The main metering system has three components, the jet needle, the needle jet, and the main jet. The jet needle has straight and tapered sections. It moves up and down with the throttle valve, changing needle jet fuel flow area to match the airflow. From idle to about one quarter throttle, the valve is low in the throat, and the straight section of the needle restricts fuel flow through the needle jet. As the throttle is opened from one quarter to one half, the needle rises farther in the needle jet. The tapered section of the needle is now exposed, and the effective area of the needle jet is increased, so additional fuel can come through the needle jet. 
from one half to three quarter throttle, fuel flow is mainly controlled by the gap between the needle and the needle jet. From three quarter to full throttle, the slide is high in the throat and the needle is no longer limiting fuel flow. At this stage, the main factor controlling the flow of fuel into the throat is the main jet, below the needle jet. Fuel atomization for all these circuits is maximized by mixing air with the fuel before it enters the carburetor throat. This mixture of air and fuel is called an emulsion. It breaks into a mist more easily than liquid fuel. For some fuel jets, there are emulsion tubes that have small holes that break up the air-fuel mixture even more. The CV carburetor is very similar in operation to the throttle valve carburetor. The CV carburetor also varies venturi area, but only in response to engine vacuum. This movable valve is called a vacuum piston. A throttle plate is added behind the venturi to control airflow. The idle low speed discharge is located behind the throttle plate, where the pressure is the lowest at small throttle openings. The upper end of the vacuum piston is fitted with seals, or a diaphragm, to make it airtight. The area above the vacuum piston is vented to the carburetor throat, so it operates at the throat's low pressure, while the area below is vented to the atmosphere. When the throttle plate is opened, the carburetor throat pressure behind the vacuum piston drops. The same drop-in pressure is fed to the area above the piston, so atmospheric pressure raises the piston keeping air velocity through the venturi high enough to atomize the fuel. The vacuum piston rises to increase venturi area until the pressure on both sides is balanced. The vacuum piston openings and jet needle movements of the CV carburetor are essentially the same as those we saw in the throttle valve carburetor. Some carburetors may also have accelerator pumps, which enhance drivability while meeting emissions regulations. The accelerator pump circuit adds a pump to the float bowl, which squirts fuel into the throat when the throttle is opened. Now this squirt of gas gives the engine the fuel it needs while the air velocity has a chance to rise and the carburetor throat pressure drops. We've just covered how a carburetor functions. For more details, you can order this book from Honda. The standard carburetor jetting is selected for best operation at sea level with a temperature of 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, changes in altitude and air temperature affect the density of the air. Changes in air density can affect engine operation because it affects the amount of oxygen in a given unit of air. This graph reproduced from Honda training material shows how the oxygen content of air varies with altitude. Air density decreases as altitude increases, so an engine operating at a high altitude takes in less oxygen with each stroke than the same engine running at sea level. With less oxygen, an engine needs less fuel. A carburetor adjusted for sea level will supply an over-rich air-fuel mixture when the vehicle is driven at, say, 6,000 feet. The opposite applies to a carburetor that's been adjusted for high altitude but operated at sea level. It will be taking in more oxygen than the fuel can use, causing an overly lean air-fuel mixture. Changes in temperature also have an effect on air density. Engines run slightly rich on very warm days because there are fewer oxygen molecules in the incoming air to mix with the added fuel. A very cold weather has the opposite effect. More oxygen molecules are packed into the incoming air. Now this causes the engine to run a little lean. Now normal variations in temperature won't cause any problems unless the carburetor is already running on the rich or lean side for some reason. Now that we know how air density affects the air-fuel mixture, let's talk about some of the variables in fuel quality which can affect operation. Now everyone's heard about fuel octane ratings, but what does the octane rating mean? other than high octane fuel costs more than regular. Well, the octane rating describes the fuel's resistance to knock. Knock is the evidence that the fuel is burning unevenly in the cylinder. In a gasoline engine, the combustion process starts when the air-fuel mixture around the spark plug is ignited by the spark. The burning mixture forms a flame front, which travels across the combustion chamber. 
Knock occurs when the fuel starts to burn at some point other than the spark plug, and the flame fronts collide inside the cylinder. Knock can reduce power, or in severe cases, damage the engine. Fuel companies add compounds to gasoline to raise its octane rating, that is, its resistance to knock. Gasoline is a mixture of chemicals. Some of these chemicals give the fuel certain burning characteristics. Others are needed to stabilize the fuel, keep it from deteriorating over time. Even so, when fuel is allowed to sit for a long time, some of these chemicals evaporate, while others change to form deposits in the fuel system. Now, if the vehicle is going to be in storage for more than a month or so, the owner's manual recommends that the fuel system, including the carburetor, should be emptied completely to avoid problems that can be caused by fuel deterioration. As we've seen, gasoline has to be atomized by the carburetor to be blended with the intake air. It then needs heat to be properly vaporized before it can be burned to produce energy. Now, most of this heat comes from the engine, but some of it comes from the incoming air. In cold weather, ordinary gasoline can't vaporize completely, causing the engine to run lean. So, fuel manufacturers formulate their gasoline according to the season. In winter, refineries add chemicals to the fuel to make it vaporize more easily. When warm weather rolls around, refiners change the formula again to make the fuel less volatile. Otherwise, it will vaporize too quickly, causing drivability problems like vapor lock. The refineries and service stations can't change fuel stocks to match sudden weather changes, so if you get complaints of poor starting or drivability during an unexpected winter warm spell or a spring cold snap, it could be due to the fuel's seasonal formulation. Another fuel quality variable that's been showing up more often is the fuel's alcohol content. Now, alcohol has been blended with gasoline to save oil and to reduce certain types of exhaust emissions. Grain belt areas have been using gasohol for quite a while. And cities like Denver have mandated use of a special oxygenated gasohol to reduce emissions. Alcohol produces less heat energy than gasoline and needs more heat energy to vaporize. Now, if gasohol is run through a non-adjusted carburetor, vaporization will be poor when the engine is cold, causing a lean air-fuel mixture. Using gasohol can result in hard starting, lower power, poor hot performance, and lower fuel economy. Because of this, the owner's manual advises owners to use gasohol that contains no more than a certain percentage of alcohol, depending on the type of alcohol that's used. But how do you know if the fuel from a particular station contains alcohol? There's a simple test, described in the October 1985 and November 88 issues of The Wrench. It involves adding the suspected gasohol to a measured amount of water in a sealed jar shaking the mixture and letting it sit. After a few minutes, the gas separates from the water and floats to the top of the jar while the water collects at the bottom. If there's alcohol in the fuel, it will combine with the water and the water line will be higher. The last thing we're going to talk about is two-stroke fuel oil premix. Now the proportion of fuel to oil is called the premix ratio. It's described in figures like 20 to 1, with the first number describing the units of fuel in the mixture. Now, when oil is mixed with fuel, the resulting premix has a little less energy per volume than straight fuel. Now, the oil does burn, but it doesn't produce much energy. Since both oil and gas pass through the fuel jets in a two-stroke carburetor using premix, the jets are sized to deliver the correct mixtures with the Honda recommended 20 to 1 premix ratio. Now, adding extra oil to the premix because you think it will lube the engine better is a mistake. Take a look at this premix chart. You'll see that too much oil actually causes a lean air fuel mixture, which could increase the engine wear and heat you're trying to avoid. On the other hand, using one of those premix oils that claim they can be used 40 to 1 will cause a rich air fuel mixture, which can hurt performance and foul the spark plugs. Any major changes from the 20 to 1 ratio will require carburetor rejetting, but that's another subject. Premix becomes really complicated in areas where gasohol is sold, 
since both alcohol and the two-stroke oil tend to lean the mixture. One final warning about choosing the oil to use in premix. You must always use a premix oil designed specifically for motorcycles, ATVs, or scooters. If you suspect a premix gasohol or other fuel quality problem, have the owner fill up at a name brand station that does a lot of business and make certain that he's using the right type of premix oil and that it's being mixed with the fuel in the correct proportions. Now with fresh fuel in the system and the proper premix ratios, well you'll know that any complaints that do come up are due to something other than fuel quality. Well, that's it. You've seen how a carburetor functions. You've seen how changes in temperature and pressure can affect the air fuel ratio. And you've learned a few things about fuel formulas, gasohol, and two-stroke premixes. These principles will help you handle carburetor and fuel-related repair orders more quickly so that you can get on to your next job.